my my main problem with the um, runic origin theories has never been that none of them are convincing, but that all of them are convincing. Sure, that's well put. The, yeah. number, the number of articles I've read where I've gone, yeah. obviously, this, yeah. this is it. That yeah. This is the solution. How did we right. never think of this? And then you read somebody else's criticism of it and go, mm, yeah, actually. Yeah. Mm, mm. No, I, you're, right. you're exactly right. That's, that's well put. Again, having you uh, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about uh, your background, your publications, what you work on primarily. Right. Well, um, everything. <laughs> um, I, I try to be quite interdisciplinary, um, which is what I call that I can't do anything properly, but I can do a lot of things. Um, I started out doing uh, German philology. And from there, I went to um, into the, the old Germanic languages and then a bit of Scandinavian studies. Um, that's where I picked up the runes. And then from there, I moved to historical linguistics and into the North Italic alphabet area. And in the North Italic alphabet, the Celts are concerned. So that's where I am at the moment with the Celts. Okay. I, can, I can follow your path there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah and, and I've published on um, runic things, well, runic things, one runic thing, the origin of the runes, which has been the uh, part of the topic of my thesis, and the North Italic alphabet. Specifically, I've worked on uh, the Raetic one and the, the Celtic one, the Lepontic one, um, because these two, um, they have online databases, which are based in Vienna. And I have been or am working on both of them. So these are my, my main foci in within the North Italic alphabet area. And do you maintain LexLep, the lexicon, Leponticum, is that right? Um, yes, um, I should say we. Um, lexicon Leponticum has been founded by David Stifter in uh, 2009, 2010. They had a, a very short project back then because they actually uh, wanted to make just a, um, an etymological dictionary of the Cisalpine Celtic evidence. Okay. So everything, not, not just the inscriptions, also the, the Nebenüberlieferung, any language material that is in any inscription within Italy and also what is attested in the cl classical authors and whatnot. Um, and they wanted to try out semantic media wiki which is um, what Wikipedia uses, but with a semantic extension, so you can tag stuff and so on. And uh, they, so they also had a technical focus. They wanted to try that out. And when they, they had, I think, a year or something, so ridiculously little time, and figured out that um, they had to discuss the sources. You, you can't just, with fragmentary language material, you can't just do an etymological dictionary without um, talking about where this is attested and how it is attested and what the reading is like and the datings for that you have to do the archaeology and so on. So they ended up starting to do a an epigraphic edition and did not have the time. So um, yeah, ever ever since the the first project ended in 2011, I think um, we've been different people and currently me have been trying to just slowly improve it and and get it up to a point where it um, fulfills its potential because it's a, it's a great site. Um, if anybody wants to look at it, I don't know um, if people maybe want to. Stella put a link in, a, in the uh, chat uh, yeah. that people can find. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really excellent resource. I mean, just you can look up any inscription and see just about anything you'd want to know about it. Not to mention it's cross-referenced. You know, I want to find inscriptions that have this letter 
or the shape of this letter. Yeah. Uh, That's just it. it. It can do a lot technically. Um, but of course, it is helpful if the material <laughs> that is in there is actually correct. So there's sure. still a lot that is based on the last print edition from 2004. Um, there's just a lot of shady readings. Mm. And I've, I've started working through that during my last project, um, the last, um, like two years ago. And I've actually got a new project now and I'm, I'm going to keep going and hopefully by the end of the next two years, it'll actually be finished. And then sort of like what you said, you can, you can click, you can go to the, to the uh, character page and click on a letter and see where that is attested. Hopefully those lists will actually be complete and reliable. Oh, it's time. already already a great resource, no matter how it's already a little bit incomplete it is. I mean, I, it I, think, it's, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad it is. It is helpful to people. I have been told that uh, it's used in teaching a lot, mm. apparently by colleagues, which is great. And do you think, uh, for those listening now or later who are a little bit newer to this, could you give us uh, an overview of the historical context of these North Italic alphabets? Uh, where are they coming from? Who's using them? What's the timeline we're talking about? Yeah, so basically um, the alphabet comes to Italy in say the 8th century BC, right? Um, and it's not quite clear who picks it up first, probably the Etruscans. So we're in um, Ischia right now. So central Italy, I think that's at the head of Naples roundabout. The Greeks had a colony and uh, they passed uh, the alphabet on to the Etruscans and also the Romans. And then the Etruscans settled in mainly Tuscany, but they, um, in, in those early phases, 8th century, 7th century, the Etruscans really controlled the trade in that area. And they traded through um, southern France, so where the Greeks then also went and, and founded Marseille, southern France and up the Rhone, but they also did um, trade uh, with Central Europe over the Alpine passes. And when the Greeks started to become more dominant in southern France, the Etruscans started focusing on the Alpine passes. So the, the great St. Bernard through Switzerland and also partly through Austria. Um, and in the fifth century, the Etruscans actually properly went north and uh, colonized the southern Paden plain. So what is today Bologna? It was Etruscan Felsina, that's originally an Etruscan city. Um, so they founded colonies there. So they got quite close to the peoples who settled north of the river Po. And those were loads of different people. Um, you have the, uh, so in what is today the Veneto and Friuli, you have the Venetians. The Venetians are speakers of an Italic language, so a language that is uh, related to um, to Latin, ultimately, and all the, the languages of Italy. Then you have the Ratians, who settle in what is today the Trentino and South Tyrol, so a bit farther to the north, and, uh, and North Tyrol also, so um, Western Austria. Um, they speak the, the Ratic language, which is uh, related to Etruscan. And then in the west of the northern Paden Plain, you have Celts various different Celtic tribes. And then in, betw in between, you also have the communions, uh, Camunni. How do I actually pronounce that in English? The Camunni. I've never and heard anyone know. say it, so I've, I've only read it. Neither, I, neither, I, I just realized, neither have I. Yeah. <laughs> only Italians, and of course, they say Camunni. So I'm, I'm going right. to stick with it. Um, that's the, the Olio Valley and sort of the Northern Lombardy. Um, we don't know what kind of language they spoke. So various different uh, speakers of various different languages. And these people to an extent controlled those Alpine passes. So the Etruscans who wanted to trade across them had to be in contact with those peoples and, um, and, and interact with them and involve them in the trade. Uh, and that's how the alphabets went north basically in the context of that, of, of that contact. Um, so all those people who settled north of the Po, um, in some variants or other, 
in some context or other got the Etruscan alphabet and adapted it slightly, more or less slightly. Um, and what we end up with, that's, it, it starts around 600 BC. Um, what, we, what we get is local alphabet variants, which are graphically very similar to the Etruscan alphabet. Um, but of course, because it's so many different languages, you get um, orthographic adaptations. Letters are used for different sound values. And also you get to a certain extent uh, graphical adaptations or slight changes in letter forms. Um, and the, the alphabets are partly tied to the languages. So we can say we have the Venetic alphabet and the Raetic alphabet and the uh, Lepontic alphabet um, and the Communic alphabet. Um, but it, it's not, um, the, the borders are not exact. So there's, in reality, there's a bunch of local Venetic alphabet variants. And there's actually sort of two different Raetic alphabets, which may have two different sources. And the Communic alphabet, there's loads of variants. The Lepontic, the Celtic alphabet is, is fairly um, homogenic, homo. Tell me what's the right word, please? Hom it's homogeneous. Not homogeneous. I, think hom hom I think homogeneous. Homogeneous, thank you. Yeah. Um, that's that's yeah. that's interesting. If if I can insert something there that I'm curious about, um, I think it was in mid 2020 that I first began to read up on some of the literature about these alphabets because I had encountered an article by by David Schnitter, um and became very curious about it and just began kind of gathering together everything that I could find and and. Sometimes these, these publications are a little bit hard to find. Thankfully, academia.edu makes it a little bit easier. Um, and a lot of it is in Italian, uh, which you know slows down my reading a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, it's the only, uh, you know, I was a classics major and, and yet I never read as much Italian as I've read in the past few years based on just trying to get into these alphabets. Um, but, you know, I, it, it seems like there's a fair amount, uh, kind of an elasticity to these alphabets as used with any given language. You know, sometimes you go to, I, I, I feel like almost none of the kind of reference sites, the Wikipedias and whatever on the internet really get this right because they'll say, you know, well, this is the communic form and this is the phonetic form and this is the lepontic form. But then you see, you know, actually there's lots of different forms that each language uses. It seems like there's not, it, the, each norm seems kind of elastic. Am, am I right in saying that? Yeah. The thing is, we do ultimately not have very many documents, mm -hmm. um, which makes it hard to, um, to say anything statistically, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Um, There are individual local alphabet, like the one of the Venetic alphabets is the Ester alphabet, right? That is very well attested um, because they, they had a big sanctuary where um, all these bronze tablets and, and styli were, um, were inscribed and then dedicated. And that's, that's one very clear thing, the Este alphabet, we can say, say stuff about that. Exactly what, what are the letter forms like on the, on the bronze tablets that is, mm -hmm. that is very well definable. And then also uh, to stay within Venetic, there's the alphabet of Padova, and then there's the alphabet of Vicenza, and then maybe you can say the alphabet that they use in the Cadore in, in the north, that is basically also the alphabet of Este. And then you start going to, I don't know, Treviso, and then Udine, and all the, all the hinterland, basically. And you have an inscription from here and two inscriptions from there and maybe five inscriptions from over there. Mm -hmm. And they're just not, um, not similar enough to each other to make any statements about what, what type of alphabet did they use in, in the Isonzo area. There's sure, I don't know, sure. seven inscriptions from there. And, and it's, it's like this everywhere else. There's, um, there's fine places where we have a lot of stuff um, and, and we, can, we can make statements and there's just a lot of fine places, an inscription here, inscription there. Um, and then it gets really hard to, to classify. 
and we can say, yeah, actually, this is technically a venetic letter form. But does that mean that we are here dealing with, um, does that make it an alphabetically venetic inscription? If we find it in, say, the Trentino, is this now a venetic inscription alphabetically? Mm -hmm. Or is it an alphabetically rhetic inscription and there is venetic graphical influence? Mm -hmm. Or is this letter form just, are we wrong to say that it's a venetic letter form? And actually rhetic alphabets have it too. So right. yeah, That's, that makes it no. difficult. And, and of course the, the fact that the, all the North Italic alphabet, they, they did not come about independently of each other. So like I said, Raetic seems to have two different ones. And one of them is very, one of one of them, the Magre alphabet, is very clearly dependent on Venetic writing traditions. But the other one, the Sanzeno alphabet, they are named about, um, uh, they are named for the, for the major fine places. The Sanzeno alphabet looks partly Venetic, but partly more Etruscan. Mm. So if, if you have like different writing traditions, that also accounts for, for similarities between, um, between alphabets across language borders. And sure. then you have secondary influence, like we can say in, in late Celtic inscriptions, we can point to individual uh, things and say, that looks like Venetic influence. They, they, they brought Kai back to write Chi, which they couldn't do before. And the, the people do that in Venetic. So that looks like they borrowed an orthographic feature from, from Venetic. And we have 550-ish Venetic inscriptions, 350-ish Raetic ones, 450-ish Celtic ones from all across the Northern Paden Plain. It's just not a lot <laughs> if you want to do these really detailed well this letter form belongs here versus this letter form belongs here it's always a bit um statistically a bit problematic well and to perhaps jump a jump a bit here you mentioned using chi to write g and of course that sounds very much like runes um and one of the things that drew my attention was features like that, some of the meta features like some of the bistrophodon writing that you see even fairly late. The, uh, uh, what Shifter has said is a, a son used to write D or Ev, which looks like runes. So you came into this with a background in old Germanic languages. And uh, I'm wondering if you have, you know, have, having probably as much knowledge of these alphabets as anyone living today. Do you have a, an opinion on the room's relationship to these alphabets that wouldn't be uh, maybe scooping your own later published work? Just uh, what, where, where do you stand on that question right now? I'm very sorry, but I'm agnostic. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm really at, at a point where the thing with the the North Italic theory of the origin of the runes. So the, the, the bundle of theories that in some way or other works with North Italic alphabets to explain the runic script. Um, how to say? One of one of the major it's 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 a you're not going to break my heart. <laughs> um, one of one of the major criticisms that is always locked at North Italic theories, which is a a valid one, is the um, the cherry picking thing. Mm. There is no single. North Italic alphabets, which can give you the runes. Right. Nobody has ever claimed that. Uh, no, actually, people have claimed that, but they have they've had to add a lot of very weird background theory <laughs> to make it happen. Um, you can find individual bits in the North Italic alphabets that look very obviously like runes, like what you just mentioned, the um, Butterfly Sun, 
in the, the Lepontic alphabet, the alphabet that was used to write the Celtic um, of Northern Italy. It's, um, do, I, do I just, do, well, you, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a St. Andrew's cross um, with two verticals on either side. Right. I and think, it looks I, exactly. I think in this, uh, audience, you can pretty much say, you know, it looks like the okay. D rune and people know what you're talking about. Okay, great, perfect. Um, yeah, it, it looks exactly like the D rune. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, it's a variant of, of Sun, which is specific to the Lepontic alphabet. Um, so it's not in Etruscan, it's something they came up with. A similar letter does appear, I think, somewhere in Sabellic, <laughs> um, but it has a different function there. Um, and Sun in the Lepontic alphabet primarily writes um, the Tau Gallicum sound. Um, are you familiar with? Yeah, isn't it a, uh, it's usually been thought to be some kind of dental that's distinct somehow. People don't know if it's by aspiration or fricativization or something like yeah. that. Exactly, it's, it's something that that uh, we see in the Transalpine Gaulish record. Um, they also have have trouble spelling it there. They in in the Greek in, uh, Greek alphabet inscriptions they spell it with a theta, and then in the Latin alphabet inscriptions they keep using the theta, and then they come up with that weird um, D with a bar or mm -hmm. S with a bar, or they come up with all kinds of weird digraphs. So the idea is that. Gaulish or continental Celtic had some kind of dental affricate, which um, was not in Latin and also not in Greek, so they could not straightforwardly spell it and had to had to make stuff up. So we would expect that in the uh, in the Cisalpine Celtic languages, and it appears um, that sun you was used to write it um, because in the Etruscan alphabet, sun denoted a a, a second phonemic sibilant, which Etruscan had, but Celtic did not have. So they basically had that uh, that letter and wrote their, their weird Africa with it. Um, and that's basically been clear since Mastranda in the, in the 1920s, that that was the function of Sun. And then David Stifter um, made a, a proper survey of all the, in 2010, a pro proper survey of all the attestations of sun at that point to try and see what actually in detail the sound value was and, and what the functions of that letter um, were. And he realized that there are a bunch of, uh, of forms that have sun in them where the letter is best interpreted as just D. And the, the exact phonetics of why that happened and how that happened are not quite clear, but he of course immediately pointed out that, well, here's this letter shape representing D, just like in the runes. Mm -hmm. is, is that not obvious? And he's right, it, it is obvious. It, the, just the, the similarity of the letters, which, which is, it's, it's, a, it's a weird letter shape. It's a rare letter, it's not trivial. Um, I, I, that has been pointed out by, by Sophus Bucke already in 1871 or something. Actually, I think it has been pointed out by Karl Weinhold in 1853. So mm -hmm. really, really early on, at, at a time when they, they weren't even, when they didn't even have a concept of what the older Futak and the younger Futak is yet. Mm -hmm. Even back then, people pointed out that North Italic letter and said, well, that's, that looks exactly like, like runic D. Um, so yeah, you, you, you can see that in the Lepontic alphabet and see, well, this is an obvious source for the D rune. So what else does the Lepontic alphabet do for us? Well, it has a form of alpha, which is identical to the A rune. That's, that's a bit that's, more trivial graphically, let's say, but still it's it's interesting. They they have that exact upright with the two with the two twigs. What else can the Lepontic alphabet do for us? Nothing. Maybe you can say they have a tendency to um, to write sigma 
with more than three bars. Mm. So they do the ziggy-zaggy thing that the, the early runes also tend to do. Um, that, that is basically it. So, or specifically so Lepontic. Specifically or, Lepontic. Right. So you can, what do you do next? Well, you look at the, the other North Italic alphabets. And the problem here was that for, until fairly recently, I would say, like I said, we don't have that many documents. So we're only since the, the 70s or the 80s have people really been sure within the North Italic alphabets now, what really are the different languages? What exactly are the different alphabets? They've, we've only just been, been picking them apart properly. And North Italic theories for the origin of the runic script have started in the 1920s. So in those early phases, people treated the North Italic evidence as one source. And you just can't do that anymore. Um, you, you can't just pick two letters from here and then Raytik has the T rune and Raytik also has that weird siggy saggy um, rune that's that has three pockets in Raytik, but if you get rid of two of them, you get the thorn rune. And then Venetic also has some stuff and, and Communic, Communic, which is the way worst understood of the North Italic alphabets. It's not even technically deciphered because the alphabets are so strange and, and we still don't know the affiliation of, of the underlying language or languages. But we have alphabetaria and there are forms in there, which again, look like runes. They have a sita, which looks like the, um, the, the broom rune. Hmm. So the I've seen that. Rune. And yeah. they have a pie that is turned sideways and has little, little feet. And what else do they have? They have a tiny little um, gamma that looks exactly like the K rune. Yeah, and That's all. I mean- They have other stuff. Communic is amazing. But again, there's a handful of graphically very uh, suggestive letter forms. And then there's other things that they, they don't have, they don't have beta, I think. There's, there's just stuff. They don't have an F, which the runes have. Right. That's, I it's think actually the, the F is the biggest, best argument you can make that the Roman alphabet has to be somewhere in the origin of runes. Yeah. Just because That's it's hard to get. Well, I've seen, I feel like, and I'm obviously you're better experienced with this than I am. I feel like I have seen inscriptions in Alpine alphabets that have an R with the diagonal line. <clears throat> yes. Um, have you, are you referring to a specific one? I would have to dig around. Not much in Lepontic. It seems like in Lepontic, it's mostly actually just that thing like this. Like it looks like a Roman because D today. If you, like a if you're not, I'll tell you something. Um, can I share my, oh no, no, I will not share my screen. I will tell you in the chat. Well, you can share screen if you want to. That's, that can be easier for, for an audience. This is a relatively recently found inscription. You can see that it was um, published in uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. And it was found in the uh, Valais, so the Upper Rhone, Upper Rhone Valley, um, which is not technically Cisalpine Celtic, um, the Cisalpine Celtic area in the strict sense, which is um, Lombardy and Piemonte and, uh, and the Ticino. But apparently some Celts also used um, the Lepontic alphabet in the Valais. 
Specifically, this inscription is from a tiny settlement or maybe just a, um, uh, a little um, military uh, fortification, um, high altitude. And it's not directly in the Ron Valley, but it's when, you, uh, when you're in Northern Italy and you go very far west and you go to Aosta. And from Aosta, you follow the river that gets you up to one of the most important uh, passes, the Great Saint Bernard, where in, uh, in Roman times, there was a big uh, sanctuary up there for the people who crossed the pass. And it was dedicated to Jupiter, as the Romans do, but it was Jupiter Poeninos, in one of these uh, cases where the, where the Romans just put one of their gods on top of a local god and then say, Jupiter, da, 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 Apollo, da, da, da. So in that case, it's Jupiter Poeninos, and the Poeninos is the name of the Celtic pass god, which probably had a sanctuary there before. That's the very well attested sanctuary. We have loads of, of Roman inscriptions. So you cross the pass and you descend and you reach the Ron Valley, ultimately, the upper Ron Valley at Martini. And before you've come out into the Ron Valley, there's Lied. And on the eastern side, up the mountain, is the, this little Mur d'Anibal um, settlement of fortification. And there's a little wall. And in that wall is built this stone that you see on the picture here. And it says, Poenino, Yeur, and then difficult to read, but probably another E, and then maybe another U. Um, I can give you the reference for a, a very interesting um, publication on, on this, a recent one by Joe Eska. So, Yeru is a word that we actually know from, uh, from Transalpine Gaulish, and it means dedicated, basically. Hmm. And Poenino is a dative, so dedicated to Poeninos. This is so cool that they actually thought it was a fake for a while. <laughs> Um, but it, it doesn't, it, there's, there's really no, no evidence that it could be. And of course, one of the first things that people have pointed out when they saw this inscription is there's uh -oh. a runic O yeah. and there's a runic R. Yeah. Um, and the thing with O is we have quite, we have a number of, of, uh, O shapes in, in, Lepontic, in the Lepontic alphabet and also in the other North Italic ones that look a bit like this, just because it's difficult to scratch a circle. And when you scratch downwards, especially on, on graffiti, on pottery, the lines will cross a bit in, in the bottom. Um, so that, that doesn't do a lot, but here on stone, you have to, to intentionally carve that. That's not the slip of the tool and twice too. That is a proper graphical variant of O. And then this R here, we would say that is Latinized because who else has that downstroke? I think the Greeks have it at some point, but not, not the proper one. But nothing else of the inscription is, is Latinized. All the letter forms are perfectly fine Lepontic letter forms. So why just the R? It's a very, very weird document, but it, it shows that sometimes stuff can pop up. We might find the missing link next week. And when I say we, I mean the archeologists. Somebody might find the missing link next week. And do you know um, Mastranda's um, original article from 18, uh, 1928? His original version of the North Italic theory. I don't know it directly. I only know it by seeing it cited. It's it's funny because he Mastranda, he, he was a, a Celticist, right? A, a Norwegian Celticist, and he in the 20s did work on the Negal helmets. So the, the inscriptions are Iron Age helmets with inscriptions that have been found in Slovenia. There's uh, three inscribed ones, and one of them is the one with the Harigast inscription. 
Um, and he published on, on those helmets in 1925 and again in 1927. And he did basically all the readings that we still have. He's the one who said, this says Harry Gaston, it's a, it's a Germanic name on the Negau helmet B. And the Negau helmet A has Raetic inscriptions and also a Celtic one. And then the helmet from Batre also has a Raetic inscription. So he did work on that. And I think that specifically the Harry Gast inscription and this notion that a Germanic name could be inscribed with a North Italic alphabet on a helmet in, in Slovenia, that gave him the idea that there uh, could be a connection between the runes and the North Italic alphabet. Um, and then he produced this huge uh, 1928 article on where, where he did a, a proper amount of cherry picking and go, well, here's, here's, the, here's the sun, which looks like the, and here's the A, which looks like the A room, and so on. Um, and when he was, he, he went to Austria to look at the helmets because they're in Vienna. And while he was in Austria, he heard that an inscription had been found. And he got all excited and he went to, I think he actually went, did he go to Carinthia? In any way, he got in contact with Rudolf Egger. Rudolf Egger was an Austrian archaeologist who was uh, digging in Carinthia um, on the Magdalensberg, which is near Virunum. And he'd found an inscription. And the, the area is basically anepigraphic, so that was a big deal. He'd found an inscription on a, um, I think it's a little, it, it's a bone of some animal. It, it, it's just it, it was a big it was a big deal and um, Ega gave Mastranda a, a photograph and Mastranda looked at the thing and said it's runes it's runes used by the Marcomanni in, in the first century AD in Corinthia huge deal this is our missing link this is our evidence for, for the most archaic runes we've had so far and they're from the south so this is this is the connection. Um, and he gave that inscription quite a prominent space in his 1928 article, as you would. And um, I, I don't have, have the, the details quite in my head, but I think around 1940-ish, another Austrian archaeologist published a paper, quite a mean one, it has to be said. That inscription was a fake. And it was one of the fakiest fakes ever because um, one of the people who had worked at that original excavation, um, not an archaeologist, they had used, um, I think, construction workers, basically, uh, jeep workers to, to do the, the main digging. And Rudolf Egger was a person who just was really interested. He was an archaeologist, but he, he liked inscriptions. And it had gotten around that he really wanted to find inscriptions. So they made him one. They just took an old object and wrote, scratched some random stuff on it. So the thing was uh, was authentic, but the inscription was not. And um, and they thought it was a joke. And then years and years later, one of the people who had done that had somehow heard that it was now a thing in the scientific community. And people were doing stuff with it and being interested in it. So he went to the police and handed himself in. <laughs> he went to the, to the police station in Salzburg and, and said, listen, I don't know what to do. I, I faked this, this inscription and I feel people should know. Well, and that's that honorable, at least. <laughs> Credit it for was, that. It, 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 um, it did damage to the North Italic theory in the mm. long run. Of course, then people said, yeah, well, that's, that makes everything that Masteranda said irrelevant, which of course it didn't. But it just goes to show that um, individual documents can do a lot and they have to do a lot in our field where we just don't have much. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's, it's a good cautionary tale. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, every time some kind of big deal inscription comes out, there's always that tiny little trepidation that it might be fake, you know, especially when it's something that sounds as cool to people as he is Odin's man or something, right? So you're yeah. just hearing about it, Mark. Um, but of course, we have to 
we have to get somewhere by trusting each other and, and let other people examine these things uh, uh, when, when, when applicable. Could, could I pose you three questions from the chat? Yep. All right, Kathy asked uh, whether these outfits would have been mostly limited to merchants or whether other groups would have been using them as well. Um, hold on. Can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, Kathy asked, oh, would... That's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we don't know. The most solid um, formation theory for any of the North Italic alphabets exists for the Venetic alphabets. Um, Aldo Ligi Prostocini has done a lot of work and he has this idea that the Venetic alph alphabet was basically borrowed twice. So mm. there was a more natural, um, more, um, more normal, I don't actually, it's hard to say what is normal, but um, he thought that the, the uh, Venetic people had already started to write with a alphabet variant that they borrowed from basically their Etruscan neighbors. Um, and then they did it again, but this time it was, um, proper writing teachers from Southern Etruria who came in and systematically adapted the Etruscan alphabet to the Venetic language and taught it. And that was in the context of, um, of actually a, a sort of writing cult. And that's where, the, where all the inscriptions at Este come from. That's why the inscriptions are written on bronze imitations of writing tablets along styli. Um, so they actually dedicated writing material because there was some kind of cult around writing. Um, so that is very clearly a cultic context um, for this script adaptation. Um, for the other alphabets, we don't know the, the context of, of the borrowing. The problem here is, of course, that we all we see is the epigraphy, right? Um, anything that merchants would have done, we don't have. So we don't know whether they used script, to what extent they used script. They probably did, whether they were the ones who were massively involved in the transfer of the alphabets. We don't know. What, what we always begin to see is um, funerary inscriptions and dedications and maybe um, workman's inscriptions or owner's inscriptions on things. All the rest is just gone. And like you, like you said earlier, it's hard to make arguments about stuff that is not there. And um, nothing has been found so far. A follow up to that from Janet. Uh, you mentioned these these tablets uh, in a cultic context. Were they dedicated to any particular deities or? Yes, um, we know because it says in the inscriptions, <laughs> which is nice. Um, a female deity called Raitia, and no, she probably doesn't have anything to do with the Raitians, even though the the name is similar. Um, so R E I T I A, um, and we don't know a lot about her. Um, it is thought that it is she who is sometimes depicted with uh, a key, and also with birds. I think so. She she's sometimes called a, a, a lady of of the animals, a bit like um, Artemis. Um, but also with the whole writing thing, there may be a, a learning Athena kind of aspect. Um, yeah, and, and I, I don't think she has any, any deities that can, can, can be compared to her in the, in the Italic region. I think she's quite on her own. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, phonetic... Uh, people have disagreed about whether it's italic or not, right? I'd... In the past, I think everybody I've talked to recently, they were very, 
a fairly certain that it's at least very italic adjacent. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think anyone ever argued about that. I just mean whether it it's it shares enough features with Latin and Fuscan and Oscan and such to be part of that that branch. That's but I was just thinking that it's at least divergent enough that presumably things like God's names and whatever, you know, there's been plenty of time for that to diverge. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, especially that, you know, we forget, I, I mean, not to open a, perhaps a small can of worms, but one thing that I spend a lot of time doing is trying to demystify runes for people because people just come at it with all these assumptions that are all based on magic to say, no, this is really interesting historically without ever getting into magic. But presumably, ancient people, among whom writing is a new technology, have some concepts of it that are wrapped up with magic and perhaps with cultic uses. And it's interesting to, to hear that. And, you know, that's, that's also potentially true of these, these precursor or aunt or uncle or whatever exactly they are, but these other outfits in use in uh, more isolated communities in, in Europe in ancient times. We, we only have, I, sh I should maybe say, we only have evidence for inscriptions in the context of institutionalized cult in Northern Italy. We don't have any evidence for any kind of private looking, magic -y, invocation -y <laughs> stuff. Which That's is, interesting. I do understand why the whole magic Thing is so big in runology still because when I compare it with my, my North Italic stuff we don't have that, those kinds of we don't have any inscriptions that even lend themselves to interpretations like the one where, where Duvel says um, the, the letters are the other way around as a sort of warding off spell or things like, like the Kilver um, stone which was laid with the alphabetarium the, the futak row down mm -hmm. like it was against a, a, a rep we don't have that kind of stuff That's they do have in in transalpine gaulish they have defixiones and all these kinds of cursed tablets and all these kinds of magic things but... that's interesting and th but then you also have an alphabet that doesn't that that looks much more removed from runes than these these alpine ones. That's interesting. I mean, and clearly those meta features and meta uses are part of this story somehow that have to be accounted for in, in understanding the origins of these alphabets. Yeah. And there's just so, so many questions here. Um, I, I, I do want to, to make sure I get these questions in chat too. Uh, Janet asks, is there any Lepontic equivalent of an alphabet song or other mnemonic alphabet list? Probably. Um, we, we have, well, we have in Venetic, the alphabet tablets and what's, what's just really cool about them is that um, they have the actual inscriptions, the dedications on them somewhere, but the, the whole bronze theme is an imitation of what be a learner's wax tablet it's like a cheat sheet it has the um the consonant row and then it has some um, so how many is it Six, 16 six the 16 consonant letters say and then above that it has in four rows the five vowels and with these you can build all the cv syllables and then it has the list of um non so of, of the uh, complex uh, consonant clusters with which syllables can begin um and then somewhere in between is is the actual dedication text that says blah 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 gave this to uh, the god of goddess of Aetia. so we have the um alphabet rows in venetic down these are not a problem um that's an interesting document uh, they, be, they are amazing these we i don't know they, we have stuff like that from nowhere else in the Mediterranean, I think. These, these writing tablets are, are great. So we know that the Venetic alphabet started with A, E, V, because they didn't use beta and they didn't use delta and they didn't use gamma. 
And now we have from the Pontic, I think, two inscriptions that also say A E V. Hmm. The thing here is that um, the Lepontic alphabet drops the gamma at some point in the fourth century, I think. Um, because, well, it doesn't matter. They drop the gamma. And um, at more or less the same time, their alpha, which is just a regular, more or less symmetrical alpha, starts going upright and looking like, like the rune. And that is the original shape of, of the gamma, which is the hasta and the two twigs. So it is assumed that these two letters were never actually homographic, right? The gamma disappeared and then alpha took its shape. But in these two inscriptions, what they actually read is the upright alpha, then an E, and then again, what looks like the upright alpha. So we would read it IA, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But you can then say, you know, if this is the first three letters of the Lepontic alphabetarium, so a past pototo alphabetarium, the first three letters representing the whole, like when, when it says futak, or just fut in, in the rooms. Or ABC, um, yeah. You would have these two letters side by side, A, alpha in its new shape, and the gamma as a dead letter, which would not appear in inscriptions anymore because it, it's now homographic to alpha. But in the letter row, you can have them, and it looks a bit weird because they look the same, but it in the context would be clear to people who have that thing in their hands and say, this is, this is how our Passportoto Alphabetarium looks like. Um, so yeah, we have two of these and the interpretation is not 100% certain, of course. They're both graffiti and it is assumed that they are shortened Alphabetaria. And this is the best we have. That's <laughs> still very great. interesting. From Communic, we have Yet again, very funky stuff. Um, Communic is attested mainly in the petrographs in the Varca Monica. Um, and they have in, in the late 80s, I think, they found these alphabetaria. And they are very long. They have, they have beta and they have gamma and deltas. And they have, I think they have xi. They have all kinds of stuff that all the other North Italic alphabets don't even have anymore. Um, and they have all kinds of wild letter forms. I think we have them. Yeah, I, actually I have it here. Can you see a table? I do see it, yeah. Bottom of the page. There we go. Oh, that's an, it's, huh. Can you? Yeah, I see. see? Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the two in the bottom, um, this one is from Pianconio. So you can see they have all the letters. And this one's from Foppa di Nadro. And we don't have datings because they're rock inscriptions. They're just on rocks in, in the Valcamonica. Sure. And you can see they have, they have a beta, clearly, because that's the position. But mm, that's they a have weird, weird beta. The one from Pianconio has this as delta. Hmm. But then they have a perfectly trivial epsilon, not mm -hmm. the uh, cursive Latin that is just two strokes, which makes such a nice model for the runic E. Sure. Then for zeta, like I said, they have rooms. Yeah. Whatever this is, some weird <laughs> theta. Is that a theta? <laughs> that's, yes. that's, that's, that's the weirdest theta I've ever seen. It is it's literally five strokes. They also have a variant that is um, five dots, like, like the five dots on a, on a dice in that <laughs> arrangement. I'll be no idea what that is all about. They have inverted lambda and epsilon. Mm -hmm. um, and they have this pi. Communic is yeah. interesting from a runic perspective. But, but that row, 
that that row is nothing like we are like so there's places where it's like no it's not but man there are some that are that line up easily you can see where someone gets super super tempted to say yeah that's obviously where lines come from thank you very much um so we, we've taken more than an hour of your time. Can, do, do we still have time for a couple of questions from the chat or? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Okay, I, I just want to be respectful of your, of your time. Um, Andrea asked, are there any active dig sites or are the inscriptions found by accident? Um, they're actually doing a lot um, recently, especially in urban excavations in Italy. Um, Urban excavations in Italy are difficult <laughs> because they have um, continuity of settlement. So places like Brescia and Bergamo and Milano, they have been the, the big proto-urban -urban settlements in the um, Lepontic time. And they're still big urban settlements now and you can't just open, open the ground. So, right. sure. so they always have to wait for, for some big building project, um, the Sofrintendenze, to swoop in and say, oh, oh, just hold it a bit and we'll very quickly dig down here. Um, they have uh, focused on this in the last, say, 20 years, and they found so much stuff. They've been able to really push back the, um, the timelines for all those cities into the uh, 6th, 7th century because they found the proper old layers. And currently what I know about in Milano is they have, uh, a few years ago, they have found the old um, amphitheater of the city. Um, and I think they, they basically bought that whole area. And now they're digging there and they have basically found um, ditches full of graffiti. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a lot happening. <laughs> That's great. I mean, and, and for what it's worth, as someone who's just fascinated by ancient languages, you know, I, I come at Old Norse and all this other stuff through historical linguistics. I'm fascinated just to learn more about, you know, another language, another chapter in ancient history, regardless of whether this winds up being you know, whether we find some smoking gun connected to, to connected to runes, it's still interesting in and of itself, yeah. um, from my perspective. Um, I think from yours. Uh, Jay asked, do we have indirect evidence like writings from other cultures uh, for the uses of these outfits that we don't have direct evidence for? So I guess people outside of these Alpine communities writing about their uses of outfits? Yeah, I don't think we do for Northern Italy. Hmm. We have a comment by, is it actually Caesar? I don't know, it might be Caesar. One, one of the big ones, one of the big names, Livy or someone, um, says something about the Greek alphabet being used by Celts in the Alps. That could mean anything. We can't even be sure that he identified the script correctly. Sure. But I actually think that is the only the only proper evidence that, that the, the only outside evidence we have for somebody saying those people wrote. It. So and, better than that, it doesn't get. And this this ties into this thing I, I've been wondering a little bit. I, I have a general sense of timelines here, but a somewhat fuzzy sense of exactly when these outfits are fading out of use. It seems like by the first century AD, there's not much use of these outfits, whether in rated or phonetic or communic or do you, When do you see the last inscriptions in these outfits? One BC. Okay. So you, you're quite right. They at, at the um, second vendor, you don't have a word for that. Um, uh, in, in the late, um, you, we, we get a certain amount of, of Latinization or sort of graphic graphic influence from, from Latin. You can sort of tell that um, by the second half of the first century BC, 
most people who could write, and we don't know how many people could write, but most of the ones who could write would have been um, biscriptal. Is that a word? Sure. So I, they would I think have you, been. We'll read, make it one. Read and, uh, they would have been able to read and write both Nepontic alphabet and Latin alphabet. So you get a bit of um, mutual influence. Um, when I look at all the inscriptions that we have in Lexlep that are from uh, AD, and we have a few, they're all Latin alphabet inscriptions with names that might be Celtic. That's, it. That's why we have them in, in the system. I think that Prostogimi for a while insisted that there are Venetic alphabets in the early first century AD in the Cadore, I think. Um, and that that was some kind of nationalistic revival um, in the in the very last phases um, in the early in the early imperial age, um, where the, some some groups in the in Venetic society said, no, 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 we have our own script, we use our own script. And, um, but I think that's that's absolutely the last thing that happens because the uh, I think the the Celts. When did uh, the province Transpadania, I think that was made a province in the early first century BC already. So mm. they held out fairly long, actually. I think they got, uh, being made of a province would have gotten them Latin citizenship. And then they got Roman citizenship, I think in the middle of the first century. So that would be the point when you, when being Roman starts really becoming attractive. Sure, sure. And when when these things would and, and then the the Ratians and all the properly Alpine tribes were um, subdued in 15 BC. That was the um, the Roman Alpine campaign of the stepsons of Augustus, where they just marched through once and and uh, won all the battles, <laughs> and afterwards the Alps were Roman. So that was 15 BC, and that's basically when Ratic literacy ends. And Venetic, I think Venetic was made into, into Regio X. That was even actually part of, of Italy proper, Venetia at Histria. So they also had Roman citizenship. And, and so, so that's the phase when, when they dropped their epicoric literary traditions. Mm -hmm. Which also has a bearing, incidentally, on the history of the runes, because it would mean that runes would have to have been inspired by them before this point, right? It would have had to have been in the BC, yeah. Which I, I, I certainly think is not impossible. And, and based on the recent discovery from Norway, we know that runes being used in the first century AD makes the first century BC not an impossible timeline. But, um, but again, as you've pointed out, and I think is, is, is a point that maybe I haven't uh, done a good job of, of communicating is that as far as individual letters, all the individual letter shapes, no single alphabet can provide them. No. As far as we know, something, yeah. yeah. I have two things to say now. Um, of course, what, I think almost all people who have presented some kind of North Italic theory have done is to work not exclusively with North Italic alphabets, but to work with some unattested alphabet variant that is Latinized. Because you need that for F and for R and ideally also for H, um, because there are no North Italic variants with just one one bar. Hmm. So, and, and then of course that sort of helps you maybe a few decades ahead. If you say, I, 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 don't, I don't need the, I don't need any North Italic alphabets in their original versions to be still attested. All I need is a Latinized alphabet that was still maybe in use in its latest phases somewhere, and we just don't, we just happen not to have evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So that that buys you a few decades to go towards the runes. 
But of course, as long as we as we don't have anything. Right. One, one interesting thing maybe um, is that um, this, this notion again has often been criticized by people who have criticized the North Italic theory by saying, well, why? Why would any Germani who want script, who see script and, and want to use script, why on earth would they use some dying alphabet mm. that is culturally completely irrelevant in, sure. in, in the greater scheme of things, when they, they must have known the Latin alphabet. And curiously, there is an answer to that, which is um, a wish for in-group writing. Mm -hmm. Um, a wish to specifically do something that is not Roman. Mm -hmm. Much in the way that I just mentioned with Venetic groups maybe reactivating their own alphabet. And that is interesting because there is actually evidence for basically all the early Celts doing exactly that. In the Lepontic mm -hmm. alphabet, they, they get their alphabet and they start writing for about 200 years. So sixth, fifth century. Um, and then there's the big Gaulish invasions of Northern Italy. And a lot of Celtic tribes come in and they uh, disrupt the Etruscan uh, trade. Etruscan Felsina becomes Boyan Bologna. Um, and the, the, uh, finds, the epi epigraphic finds dry up. So it looks like um, with the disruption of the older Celtic culture, that was the, the, the Lepontic culture, um, the alphabet sort of stopped being used. The Gauls appear to have not been terribly interested in it. They appear to not have, to have just taken it on for their own Gaulish language. But then 200 years later, um, second, first century, so exactly at the time when the big political conflicts of the uh, Italian Gauls with Rome start, suddenly all the inscriptions, almost like um, they had gotten in contact with Rome and seen writing, but not um, taken on the Latin alphabet, but reactivated something they already had. And you can make the same argument for the transalpine Gauls, because the Greek alphabet had been in Gaul since the foundation of uh, Marseille, at least, so at least since 600 BC. And we have no Gaulish writing, nothing, absolutely nothing, until the second century when they start having conflicts with Rome. They start writing. But do they start writing with the Latin alphabet? No, they start writing with the Greek alphabet, which they could have done for ages, but didn't bother. And the exact same thing works with the um, Celt Iberians. The Iberian script had been a script of neighboring peoples for ages. When do the Celt Iberians start to write? At the time of the Numantine Wars in 150 BC. They start writing, they even start writing stuff that is very clearly inspired by Latin literacy, so public inscriptions. It, it's clearly Roman in nature, but what script do they use? The Iberian one. It, it, it looks very, it all looks a bit anti. Right. You know I mean? Right. Well, and, so, and in a more recent analogy, I mean, you think about uh, uses in, in well, Fraktur to write German versus uh, Roman script to write Romance languages in English, right? There's something, it's, it's the same alphabet, but it's there's a, a visual reminder of separateness yeah. to it. Um, and I see what you mean. In-group writing is a, is a big thing generally. And of course, it's always, it's very hard to argue for for ancient cultures. We have so much evidence for it for modern cultures. There's entire books about just examples for in-group writing about who chooses what script, who chooses to represent, like if, if you have a within a, a, a nation state, a community which has a different religion than everybody else. So you, you very often see see people like uh, in Taiwan. Um, sure, they traditional Chinese writing. In, traditional Chinese letters to make a statement about how they are their own culture. And right. more of the same Chinese. We have so much evidence for that from, from modern times. So mm -hmm. it's, we'd have to assume that it also happened in antiquity. Only it's very hard to really conclusively argue it. 
Right. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, we can't prove any of this unless somebody wrote about it 2000 years ago, but it's, but it's a fascinating point to make that very similar thought processes about this might occupy people 2000 years ago. Um, especially maybe even more so than when writing is a more restricted activity, you don't have to reteach an entire population. It's just that the elites who are producing the written material have to agree that this is a, a reasonable move. Yeah. So it's actually in a way kind of easier to do, to make that change maybe. Uh, that's fascinating. And it could also help explain some of the tiny little differences that you see between say, phonetic writing, radic writing, communic writing, or concept writing. It's just that over time people have made small or they picked up small changes and, and, and generalized them just because it's like, well, this is going to be our unique little Lepontic thing that we're going to do. This is going to be our unique little radic thing we're going to do. And runes could originate to some extent from, you know, some subset of one of those that we don't know about, but again, how do you prove it? Right, unless you find that subset used somewhere. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of questions here. There's more questions than answers all the time, it seems like. Absolutely. There's so much literature on the origin of the runes. I've read all of it. <laughs> and I, I still don't know. <laughs> well, so actually, Denise has read all of it, but I've read most of it. Well, I have. Uh, I have swum in it. I don't think I've read all of it. I, I, I feel like that's a whole decade uh, of work reading all of it. Um, would you recommend any particular readings uh, for people listening today or later uh, to get acquainted with these Alpine scripts? Anything that's a, a good start in whether in English or German or, oh, or Italian? Yes, actually. Hold on. I'm going to show you something. Okay. Yeah, I, I like your mysterious, misty uh, atmosphere there. It's quite dark outside now, so I only have my. Let's see, I haven't looked at myself in a while. I already start looking like I'm ascending. Just... <laughs> ascending. Please. <laughs> um. So there's been an initiative for Paleo-European writing. It was an EU project, a, a net networking project in the so 2015 to 19. Mm -hmm. And the, the group that was involved is, is, is still active after the, after the project. It's called ALAW, A-E-L-A-W, Ancient European Languages and Writings. Okay. Um, so it's about all the pre-Roman epigraphy from Europe, um, everything in, in Italy, all the, the Italic stuff, Sabellic and Piscine and whatnot, and the stuff from, from Sicily and the North Italic stuff and Etruscan and then Iberian and everything that happens in, in Spain and Gaulish. And um, they have produced a very useful thing which was okay. published as um, a volume of Paleo Hispanica. And I think, uh, and uh, that's yeah. a whole that's that's a whole rabbit hole itself. Uh, is, uh, that old that old uh, Iberian so. which is an epigraphic culture. And what it what it does is it has a chapter on every Paleo-European epigraphic corpus. And some of them are Italian. I think some of them are also Spanish, but they have uh, English abstracts at the very least. And also a lot of them are English. Um, so they have, um, and, and they are, it, it's, it's, uh, the concept is that of a handbook. So all the chapters are introductory. What do we know? And what are the next steps of what we'd like to know? Um, so this is extremely extremely useful and there's also overview stuff about alphabet adaptations and the end of alphabets and um, some more more general things um, there's two volumes so these are shorter ch chapters and then another thing the ALO initiative did was um, make these booklets hmm. basically the same thing just a bit more um, detailed 
and these are very well illustrated. Now you can see that. <laughs> it's kind of glowing at me. But... Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice color. Color pictures. You. Okay. Very cool. Uh, these, are, these are these are great. Um, lavishly illustrated and also introductory, and okay. I think they can still be ordered from from uh, Zaragoza. And we don't have all the corpora, but we have quite a lot. We have Cisalpine Celtic. That's the witch gifter. We have one on Holland. Huh. Um, we have Aquitanian, we have Gaulish, we have Faliscan, we have Etruscan, Lusitanian. So, but by, by the way, American uh, American audience members, these are on Amazon. Okay. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if they're on. Uh, I think that was the original price, nine euros per, per booklet. Um, they are very useful. Um, and yeah, that's absolutely the most up to date thing okay. I can I can tell you. Of course, there's loads of literature, but most of it, as you said, is in Italian. <laughs> yeah, um, which you know, thankfully, I know some people very enthusiastic about Italian, and uh, um, you know, I can figure it out. But yeah, it slow, it slows me down at just a touch. <laughs> Well, I have a, I have a really, sorry. sorry, we keep having like audio collisions where we both start at the same time. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and giving us uh, not only rich information, but also your, your take on this, which is, I think, a very responsible one uh, that you can't make provable claims here about the connection to runes. But what you have is a very interesting historic or even prehistoric story about uh, about the spread of writing. Yeah, I mean, like I said, who knows what we what they find in this season's sure. excavations? There's yeah. always more to come. And the thing is, in the 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 first publication in the study of North Italic alphabets was Theodor Mommsen in 1853. And he had 40 documents. He didn't even try to classify languages. He just tried to, to classify the alphabets a bit. And he had, he had this list of, of 40 things. And he actually says at some point, well, this is, I, I, I couldn't do a lot here, but maybe sometime more, a few more documents will pop up. And then maybe people will be able to use this and, and contextualize it more. And now we're nearing 2000. So you always, you, you can't do anything better than just work with what you have and try to, to get that in order with um, proper editions so that any new uh, material can be easily and quickly put into its proper context and be used to illuminate everything that is around it. Right. Well, and I've been following it quite eagerly now for a couple of years and and uh, I hope to continue to see uh, new stuff from you and perhaps if you feel like you're coming back and talking about it when there are new uh, new discoveries in this field because I think this is of great interest to people with an interest in runes whatever we may ultimately find out about the connection to runes if nothing else it's a reminder about um, just how varied uh, the output was as it was transmitted around in ancient times. Definitely. Well, I am going to uh, have to go from now and conclude this. But again, thank you so much for your time, and um, thank you, I wish I wish you all the best. I, I hope I, I hope it was interesting, and I hope I said everything. It's it's so difficult. <laughs> you never notice when you leave great big holes in your presentation. Oh wow. <laughs> Oh, I, I know what you mean. These are open access. I forgot to say that. Oh, okay, so, great. Paleo Hispanica. These you don't have to buy. Thankfully. That's another, <laughs> yeah, that's... That's another great. Um, that's great good to know. Advantage of them. Well, thank you again very much, and all the best to you, and all the best to everybody who came. Thank you. Bye.